Okay. Oh, yeah, you can hear it, right? Yeah? Okay. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Grom and I am um, one of the lawyers and one of the cell leaders here at Church of Southland Chino. Um, so I was asked to give this um, voter guide workshop and um, I do want to um, apologize in advance if anything that I say makes you angry. Um, <laughs> but to be perfectly honest, I actually hope that um, after you come out of here, I hope you actually do feel a little bit disturbed um, because there is a lot of, uh, there's just a lot going on and I hope that you do feel a little bit more informed. Um, so uh, I'm gonna begin with a quick prayer. <coughs> um, Father, you are um, our great and awesome God and we are so thankful that um, you are still sovereign over us. Uh, we pray that as um, a nation and specifically as believers, uh, won't you give us uh, convictions today? Won't you um, bring a spirit of revelation into this place? And um, if any of our beliefs or our opinions have been based on lies or deception or um, misinformation, we just ask God that you would um, give us humility, um, help us to um, yeah, just really listen for the voice of your Holy Spirit. And uh, Father, we ask that your truth would reign here and uh, that you would really lead this time and um, all the words that I speak, that it would be from you. So we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. So I wanted to start with, um, it's a little bit of a history lesson actually, but uh, why our country is, is so special is because our founding fathers um, received this divine revelation to do something that was so different from any other nation at the time with these three branches of government. Um, and I'll kind of get into why I'm reviewing this, but the legislature is, you know, Congress, the House of Representatives, and the Senate. Their job is to make the laws. And the reason for that is because we are directly electing these representatives. And so that's why it's supposed to be by the people that we're actually, you know, um, appointing them to represent us. And then the executive branch, uh, the president and vice president, is there to enforce the laws that were made, again, by the legislature. And then the judicial branch, the US Supreme Court, and all the courts underneath, including state courts, are there to interpret the laws that were written, and then also um, punish those who break these laws as well. So the reason why I want to remind you of these three basic um, fundamental separate branches of government is because there has been a lot of overreach and a lot of the branches are doing things that they uh, are not supposed to be doing or at least they strayed from the original intent, which is that there should be a separation of power. Um, and so again, this whole system of checks and balances really was such a divine idea, especially at the time. And I highly recommend this biblical citizenship class that um, several of my Southland friends and I took in the fall of 2020. It's called Constitution Alive by the Patriot Academy. And it's like a civics class for everyday citizens like us, but they really go into what the Constitution actually says, which most of us forgot, and, um, and how they came up with you know, each of those uh, terms and phrases. Um, so I recently learned about a movement, I think there's more than one, but specifically for churches. And this one is called um, The Church Finds Its Voice. And it's an initiative by a local um, organization actually here in Santa Ana and Sacramento called the Pacific Justice Institute. They want to unite churches to inspire their members to vote based on biblical principles because the trajectory of this nation matters more than ever. And um, I'm gonna provide a resources page at the end and also a, a QR code so you don't have to like um, take pictures of the links or anything. Um, okay. So how we want to start, oh sorry, this is, okay. I did want to give some guidance in how do we evaluate um, a party's platform or when a politician or candidate makes promises or when they suggest certain policies or propose certain things. 
So uh, we do want to make sure that we're checking on, is this government overreach? Because policies sound really good. I mean, of course they sound good, because why else would you vote for them? But um, they actually hire marketing agencies. I don't know if you knew this. Um, to write the policy so that it sounds as appealing to the general public as possible. So my first question that I would ask yourself is, are they using fear um, to manipulate you? And I think the best example of this was during COVID. Um, COVID was, a <laughs> was an excuse to necessarily shut down, unnecessarily shut down a lot of schools, a lot of businesses. And I really question, was it for public health reasons? Or um, if you look at the effects, I'm sure you remember this, but nail salons, hair salons, um, a lot of other types of businesses could have stayed open if just the proprietor and the customer both wore masks, which reduced the you know, contagiousness by 90%. Was it really necessary at the time to completely shut down all those businesses, thrusting many small businesses and their owners into bankruptcy because of a cold virus? And another example is um, the public schools. So. Apparently, while our governor's daughter continued to attend a private school in person, children in the inner city suffered a major setback of an entire year of public school education. And even if you give everyone an iPad and say, okay, Wi-Fi is free for all these homes, um, that doesn't mean that online classes are effective. And I'm sure the teachers in the room will agree that it wasn't. Um, plus, many of these children actually needed the school breakfasts and lunches. In other words, um, they were waiting at home all day for their parents to come home and feed them dinner. And so without this, their physical health and growth was stunted because they were fasting every day. And so these are all massive repercussions of just this you know, decision to like, oh, we need to shut down schools, we need to shut down businesses. And um, on a side note, I have some friends that are school nurses, and you may have noticed that you know, at first that policy of like making all the kids wear masks in school, again, it sounds good, but kids, at least for us when we were growing up, you know, we we're supposed to cough on each other and like <laughs> give each other like colds and flus and all these things because it builds up your immune system. So the following year after that, the, the flu season was really bad for like all the kids. I'm sure for those parents you may have noticed because their immune system wasn't actually built up by very normal um, experiences that we should have had. So the second um, factor or kind of um, determin determining factor I want you to think about is, does this policy actually solve a problem? There's a lot of laws out there that I always kind of question what was the problem they were trying to fix or did they make up a problem to um, <laughs> try to justify this law? Um, so as an example, there's a lot of new policies telling teachers and school administrators not to tell parents if a child wants to be called a different pronoun or wants to be a different gender. What exactly was this trying to address? So what's the problem? I kid you not, there's language in these bills that says the parents are the oppressors of their children and that the government knows better what they need. This is straight up demonic because it's just trying to literally rob parents of the God-given right to raise their children. It's not even a man-given right. But I'm really proud to report that actually here in the Chino Valley School District, um, their school board had passed a, a policy about a year ago saying that no parents have the right to be informed. And then our governor, attorney general, and like the state of California basically sued this school district to say, oh, somehow like that's, that's not okay because again, parents are the oppressors of their own children. Um, so yeah, this is something that uh, we really have to watch out for. And I confirmed with a school administrator um, because I have friends that are school counselors and teachers that in California right now, the law is that anyone over 12 years old can go get the gender transformation surgeries and literally th the teachers cannot tell their parents. Okay, another example is uh, the $21 uh, minimum wage law for fast food restaurants. So again, politicians love presenting a narrative that markets their laws and policies, but was this law really good and what did it do? Um, so Blaze Pizza, um, I'm sure many of you guys know, they decide to leave California because they can't afford to keep its franchise locations open if they have to pay their employees a minimum of $21 an hour. So I'm sure you'll be able to tell, like, 
we all have biases, and mine is I'm a small business owner, <laughs> and I, I serve small business owners, so I really have a heart for those that are just trying to stay in business. And what I realize about minimum wage laws is you're just giving people a raise, but you're not rewarding them for their performance, which really takes away from the motivation for anyone to do any better as an employee because the government's just guaranteeing that you'll keep getting paid more. Um, so back to this fast food law, the fast food chains that actually did stay here had to raise their prices <laughs> in order to you know, obey this law, so they thereby passed the cost on to us as consumers. So I hope you guys have noticed how expensive an In-N-Out double-double combo <laughs> is these days. I was like, over $10? Like, when did this happen, right? Um, but anyways, so instead of raising the threshold of guaranteed minimum wages for fast food workers, what this law actually did was cause hundreds of thousands of jobs to leave the state. So that didn't help anyone. That actually increased the rate of unemployment in California. So again, raising the minimum wage, it always sounds good, but it's like slapping a Band-Aid on a much deeper problem, and they never explain to you what the logical end result actually is. So when, um, number three is when researching candidates for leadership positions, keep in mind that um, this is something that Pastor Keith actually said <laughs> back in 2020 is you're not choosing your friend. Um, you're not choosing someone who's likable or who's like you. You're choosing someone who will be a strong leader, who exercises wisdom and humility and hopefully seeks the Lord, someone who's wise enough to lead this nation back to the Lord with values and policies that honor him. Now, I'm not saying that that strong leader necessarily has to be a believer. We're not looking for someone who's Jesus, right? But um, in the Bible, in the book of Ezra, I believe, um, there was a pagan king named Cyrus, and God totally used him to favor the Israelites, and then they were all able to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So, yeah, there are people that God can use regardless of whether they are actually a believer, but you've got to look at their values and policies. Is that what they're doing? Um, so I wanted to give some examples of um, how President Biden, our most you know, recent president, um, he's a very easygoing and nice guy, that's the impression, um, but there were um, certain things about his presidency that I will find most memorable. So uh, in his first week of office, he signed dozens of executive orders that require public schools to honor a student's decision of gender identity. So that allows them to use whatever bathroom or locker room they choose and participate on a sports team that is aligned with their gender identity. Instead of letting states protect their public school students, he decides to make a federal law. Remember, that's not his job. <laughs> his job as a head of the executive branch is to enforce the laws, not make new ones. So the result is that a high school boy could demand access to a girl's locker room on a random day and tell his teachers it's because he feels like he's a girl today. Violating all those girls' privacy rights, like what happened to Riley Gaines, the swimmer. So don't get me wrong, it's not just President Biden. President Obama, President Trump, they all made a bunch of executive orders as well. But if you look to see what those orders were, you can tell what they valued and what was it that they were trying to promote and get across. The second thing was when um, President Biden um, his chaotic evacuation of U.S. forces from Afghanistan, it caused unthinkable casualties and tragedies and the Taliban to take over and the Afghan government to collapse. So in case you didn't know, our president of the United States is also our commander in chief of our military. And so the decisions they make makes a huge impact around the world. Um, and I'm just one of those people who does believe that the U.S. has a responsibility to protect other nations, that we've been given, you know, the superpower abilities um, for a reason. So, yes. Uh, number three is that um, he decided to celebrate Transgender Day of Visibility on March 31st, earlier this year, which happened to be Easter Sunday. And the, the White House spokesperson said publicly, oh, President Biden's a Christian. He celebrates Easter with his family. But... <laughs> but somehow, um, President Biden decided publicly that he wasn't going to say anything except to honor the ordinary courage and, or sorry, extraordinary courage and contributions of transgender Americans over honoring the Lord Jesus that he claims to love and serve. So in order to, 
look for someone whose values and platforms honors the Lord. This is kind of my exhortation to all of us is we have to know the Bible. We have to know God's truth. Um, you should ask yourself, what is the Lord's perspective on abortion, on gay marriage, on socialism? Don't just pull out random Bible verses to support the opinions you already have. Um, I learned this from Pastor Sam's Bible study this past summer. There's a difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Um, and a lot of us just inject our own ideas into the text and then we say, see, this is what the Bible says. And if you're not clear or if you are confused, then ask our pastors. That's what they're here for. And so what I included here, if you look, is, is just resources actually that our church has already provided. About a year ago, we had a, a group called the Explicit Movement come and they did some incredible talks on transgender sexual identity issues. Um, the next one is a sermon that Pastor Keith did about the right to live. And then um, for some of you who may not know, there's a, a Saturday kind of episodes of Ask Pastor Keith, where he would address <laughs> various questions that people um, brought up. And this was a couple of them, how to evaluate candidates who support abortion or socialist policies. and whether socialism is biblical, and he answers those questions. So the next one is um, don't innocently trust media sources. And I'm sorry to tell this to you because I know a lot of people like get news like all the time and you're just like, oh, wow, this happened and that happened. But unfortunately, no one is objective anymore. No one's just reporting the news or what happened. Um, there is... Some of you may know this guy named Tim Pool, who's a centralist. He said he's just trying to be an investigative journalist, but then he gets criticized by one side for being like completely on the other side. Um, so if you're going to watch CNN and ABC, CBS, then you have to watch Fox News and then w read the Epoch Times as well, because you really can't get the whole story. And you need to see that they describe the exact same event, even the same speech, very differently. And you can tell by, like, the sound bites and everything. But um, when asked four years ago, Pastor Keith said that he actually listens to foreign news sources like BBC and German or other broadcasts because the U.S. media has unfortunately been bought. And what I mean by that is um, there is a major network I can think of that's been purchased by another wealthy nation that's outright anti-U.S. So um, whatever way that they can influence, you know, our nation to implode from within, um, that's what they're trying to do, and there's no more purely just investigative journalism, like Time Magazine used to be, New York Times, um, the Washington Post. Sadly, there is someone behind the scenes who is paying to control the narrative and wants to control what you hear and what you perceive. And finally, um, I would encourage you to fact check the claims and the s statistics of the politicians that you're researching. So personally, again, I'm very wary of those candidates that are what I call career politicians. Um, this means that they haven't lived an ordinary life like a citizen for a really long time. Um, they're not anyone's employee. Uh, their children don't go to public schools. Um, they don't know what it's like to own a business. Um, and because they're people pleasers, you'll notice that they uh, say completely inconsistent things like a couple months apart, right? Because they just say what people want to hear. Uh, you don't really know what they stand for, and then they'll just cover up their tracks. So their view on how their policies are impacting millions of people is so far removed from reality. Maybe they don't care, or maybe they know and they're doing it on purpose. I don't know. Um, but to be honest, some of them are being used by Satan to execute his policies that is completely set on destroying families, destroying children, and destroying businesses, um, like it says in John 10.10. 10. So to give you an example of this, um, recently the Biden-Harris administration claimed that overall violent crime has gone down in this country, which is interesting since everyone knows that after the defunding the police movement in major cities like Chicago, Seattle, SF, and LA, crimes of all kinds have skyrocketed uh, total violent crimes, according to the Crime Prevention Research Center, have gone up by 55% during the Biden administration. And soft on crime law enforcement policies in certain major cities are likely a significant contributor. Unfortunately, the rate of crimes being reported to the police has fallen. 
which is where uh, President Biden and Harris, Vice President Harris are making their claim, but the reason is because law enforcement in this country, particularly in large cities, has collapsed. We've never seen such low arrest rates in over 70 years. So police forces, as you know, have been disabled and defunded in a lot of major cities across this nation. So that doesn't sound like crime is getting better to me. Um, now, I'm gonna go to something really practical, which is the California state ballot propositions, <laughs> which I think are a mystery for many of us. Um, this is my disclaimer. I don't represent the views of Church of South Lan Chino or any of the leadership here. Um, this is my personal opinion, um, but uh, I would say most of these state ballot uh, measures, I tend to vote no. Um, <laughs> I just uh, really don't trust our legislature anymore to uh, do what they promise to do with taxpayer money, and when they're raising bond money and all these other things, it promises a lot, um, but in the past 20 to 30 years that I've been a voter, I haven't really seen the results of that. So um, what I would recommend is, if you look at the top of this slide, is in your ballot, you should be able to see the, uh, the pros and cons. So it's like arguments for and arguments against each of these um, propositions. And then I would also review which organizations support this and which ones are opposed, okay? Because that tells you a lot as well. So um, I'll try to explain briefly all of the ones that are on the ballot this year. Number one is Prop 2. It authorizes bonds for public school and community college facilities. So um, translation, <laughs> the state wants to borrow $10 billion to renovate public schools and community college facilities, which will cost taxpayers, us, approximately $18 billion when we pay it. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, Prop 3 amends the California Constitution to recognize the fundamental right to marry regardless of sex or race. What does that mean? It removes language in the California Constitution that marriage is only between a man and a woman. Yes, can you believe that's actually in the California Constitution? So if you believe that marriage should only be between a man and a woman, then you're going to vote no on this one. I just want to clarify because a lot of times they love using double negatives to kind of confuse you about what you're actually voting for. Okay. Prop 4 um, authorizes bonds. Again, there's that word for safe drinking water, wildfire prevention, and protecting communities and natural lands from climate risks. So these are very worthy causes, of course. We want to have safe drinking water. We want to have wildfire prevention. The problem with this, the state raising bonds, is why weren't these issues actually addressed in the state's budget? And the state's budget is in horrible condition, by the way. So that's why they have to keep raising more money, you know, which is, uh, again, um, us taxpayers that are going to pay for it. Prop 5 allows local bonds, they really love bonds, um, for affordable housing and public infrastructure with 55% voter approval. Um, legislative constitutional amendment, this means, I, I think this is what it means, is that the state legislature is trying to amend what's in the California Constitution. So, um, again, translation, this basically means higher property taxes to repay local borrowing. And that's gonna be paid bar by not just homeowners, but renters and consumers, which is pretty much everyone in this room. Uh, Prop six eliminates constitutional provision allowing involuntary servitude for incarcerated persons. It just means jails and prisons won't be allowed to force incarcerated persons to work anymore. Okay. Prop 32 raises the minimum wage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to say more about this, but um, what I am going to say is even if you vote no, and there's like specific numbers there, even if you vote no on this proposition, did you know the minimum wage is going to go up anyways? Because it's already in some other law that was already passed. It's going to go up to $17 by January 2026. So saying yes to this, it just makes it happen faster, which again has huge repercussions for small businesses across the state. Prop 33 um, expands local government's authority to enact rent control on residential property. Um, this means that state law can no longer limit the kinds of rent control laws that cities and counties have. So, yeah, there's so many um, terms like minimum wage and like affordable housing and rent control, and it all sounds good, like, oh, we're going to solve the homelessness crisis. 
Um, again, I'm just very wary, but you know, please do your homework on this one and vote the way that you feel, see fit. Okay, um, so there's two of them that have to do with healthcare. And again, I don't pretend to be any kind of ex expert on the healthcare system except what I've experienced as a patient. Um, but Prop 34 says it's restricting the spending of prescription drug revenues by certain healthcare providers. So what's interesting about this one is it's really vague. Like certain healthcare providers, well, who is that? Is that mine? Is that like a Kaiser? Is that like, you know, so what is this actually saying? And then, it's requiring them to spend a certain amount of money that they get from a federal discount prescription drug program on direct patient care, which generally it sounds good, um, but the <laughs> statewide negotiation um, of Medi-Cal drug prices, again, I can't tell who's benefiting here. I don't know if it's actually getting to the patient. All I looked at was um, what's called the fiscal impact that you see on your ballot underneath each of the props. It says, increase state costs in millions of dollars annually to enforce new rules. Um, Prop 35, also a healthcare one, it provides permanent funding for Medi-Cal healthcare services. Okay, what this one is about is our state pretty much has run out of money to provide Medi-Cal. <laughs> um, for, you know, we have a lot of seniors, obviously aging population, people aren't getting any younger, but they're living longer. Um, so what this is doing is making permanent a tax so that, again, they can get the money for Medi-Cal from us. Um, it's saying something about how, oh, if it gets approved by the federal government, this is what it will do. Um, so I'm very wary of this language because what if it doesn't get approved by the federal government and we all voted yes? Then what it did was we just said yes to like a tax, you know, that's permanent. Um, and then the last one is Prop 36. It allows felony charges and increases sentences for certain drug and theft crimes. Um, it's about uh, possessing certain drugs and then thefts for under 950. Um, so I don't know that much about the criminal justice system. I think we can ask like the cops at church, those in law enforcement, but again, I looked at the fiscal impact. If this is gonna increase <laughs> state criminal justice costs by hundreds of million dollars annually, I would rather have them spend that effort on violent crimes, not on people who possess some drugs or that kind of thing. And honestly, I think because of the open corner ministry at South and Anaheim, I'm thinking about those that you know are trying to get a fresh start and then you have a felony charge. It's very different from a misdemeanor on your record. So again, just that's my personal. Um, but do your homework and ask, um, especially for the healthcare ones, I would say ask you know people in healthcare, hopefully on the administration side and um, get some insights. So I decided not to go over the presidential candidates and by party platform. I think it's pretty obvious what they stand for, but what I did was I got a resource, which again is available to you by a, a organization called Real Impact. What they did was they took um, specific issues that Christians should care about, um, such as sanctity of life, religious liberty, same-sex marriage, Israel, climate change, children's gender identity, and then just a side-by-side -side comparison of where each of them stand. And um, uh, the what I like about this organization is they actually pulled from just public media sources. So it's like, oh, this is what they said. And then there's a quote, you know, kind of thing. So that's where you can find that. And uh, this Real Impact Organization actually also has a guide for local elections. So there's specific to California, specific to your county, maybe even your city. Um, and then the Huey Report is something that Craig Huey puts together for conservatives um, in terms of, you know, again, interviewing, um, kind of doing all the research for you. And then um, someone provided this to me is for those who live in the Placentia Yorba Linda School District. Um, this is a resource about voting for the school board. So um, for local elections, like your city council members or school board or even your US representatives for your district, I would look up the candidates on Google. Seriously, very simple or like on LinkedIn. Um, anywhere that they have a candidate statement and just see if you can figure out their stance or their uh, position on things. If they were the incumbent, which means that they hold that office right now, then they have a track record. And so you can look at that and see, you know, what did they do? What did they vote for? And if they're new, then just Google them and kind of pretend that you're like a PI. And don't just do a search on like 
oh, John R. Smith, but something like John R. Smith, Fullerton City Council, you know, or Judy Jones, Chino School Teacher and Parent. And maybe ask your kids' teachers if they know these people that are running for school board, what they think of them. Um, if your city holds like a public forum or town hall meeting to meet the candidates who are running for city council, try to attend those. Um, you can actually learn a lot. And um, for judges, I don't know if there's any on the ballot this time around, but for judges, you can usually find a public bio somewhere. And then again, if you Google them, you might be able to find like cases that they've actually, um, case opinions that they've written and what they've decided. So um, yeah, the main kind of, uh, uh, I guess, exhortation today is um, we really need to pray, and I would invite you to consider fasting for this year's elections. Um, this uh, link right there is actually something I've used to pray over the, I think, 2016 and 2020 elections, and I kind of did it like a 40-day uh, prayer. Um, so I, I want to read for you from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, because this was a plea from Apostle Paul, which is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Basically, these verses, it reminds us that there are some candidates whose time in that position of authority will enable the furtherance of the gospel here in the U.S. and abroad, while others will clearly oppose and hinder the gospel from being spread. They will restrict churches and violate our religious freedoms. So I also have a, um, another set of resources I'll go over really quickly. So the American Family Association provides an I voter guide. If you click on that one, you actually type in your exact street address, and then they will show you everything that's on your ballot, and actually down to the school board and city council and who, who is running. Um, and then they also, again, try to do some research and collect information for you on the candidates. Um, Americans for Limited Government, um, they're actually, how should I say, not Republican, not Democrats. They're um, libertarian, <laughs> I think. Um, so they're really into government just needs to be more limited. And that's actually uh, the original intent of the Constitution, that government has had way too much say in all these little nitty gritty areas of our lives and needs to you know, back off kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, I, I found this site very interesting. And then Pacific Justice Institute, again, they are a nonprofit here in California. Um, and what they do is they actually defend people whose First Amendment rights have been violated. They do it for free because they completely take just donations. So they have a bunch of lawyers on staff and then they go and, you know, fight for different people's rights. It's been um, the religious freedom violations since 2020 it has skyrocketed. And I actually heard that this, they used to just be in Sacramento and Santa Ana, now they're in like 26 states. So, um, and then the, uh, they're also the ones that did the initiative, Church Finds Its Voice. Um, Capital Resource Institute is, um, this is really good for parents. Um, this particular woman, her just whole um, passion right now is to protect parental rights. So um, as a parent, if you look on her resource, you'll see how you can protect your kids from all kinds of porn and just crazy sex ed that's like in the classrooms, in the school libraries, things you have no idea are there. And she brings everything to your attention. And she's a spokesperson now, not just for California, but she goes all over the US to kind of inform, um, again, parents and, and cities and school districts. Um, the Patriot Academy is the one that offers the biblical citizenship class. And then Presidential Prayer Team is an organization, I think they started back in 2000. So it's been around for 24 years, and they pray for the president, no matter who it is, every day. And then they send out, when you sign up, they send out um, prayer topics for the whole nation, what's going particularly in the military, and then with the president. Um, so they have something called Pray the Vote Guide, and I actually dropped this into the drive as well, so that's already downloaded for you. And then the last one is... Um, a couple months ago, in uh, end of July, Pastor Keith did a sermon during the AMI Leadership Conference. Um, he actually talked about how 
uh, the enemy, like demonic activity is increasing. It's becoming very obvious. And um, basically it's showing up as these anti-human policies and endeavors. And it's not very subtle anymore, like abortion, where people are like, oh, you know, maybe it's like controversial, but it's very direct now. And I think this was very insightful. So I'd love for you guys to listen to it. So in conclusion, um, it's, it's so interesting, PR's um, message today, yes, we should pray um, because we have to fight this battle on our knees for sure. It's a spiritual battle, but we also need to vote. And our part is, um, this link is to make sure that you're registered to vote. In California, the deadline is October 21st. So please make sure if you didn't already get a ballot or something kind of in the mail, then you might not be registered officially. So you should make sure. Um, I just want to encourage you, um, don't raise your children to be victims who whine and complain that like, oh, the system is wrong and everything's so broken, but they don't take action. Do something, but be wise and understand the times that we live in. Ask God for discernment and how to choose the best leaders for your city, school, state, and nation, and ask him what pleases him and what doesn't. Um, I'll end with a quote from Samuel Adams, one of the founding fathers of America. Let each citizen remember at the moment he is offering his vote that he is executing one of the most solemn trusts in human society for which he is accountable to God and his country. My hope and prayer, honestly, is that our Southland Chino kids and those that are growing up at our AMI churches will be champions of truth. And that as their friends are being so confused by like social media and media and what the government's telling them, what their school is telling them, that they will be able to direct them like this is God's truth and you know, this is what it is and to be the influencers. So when we stand before Jesus someday, he is gonna ask us if we made the most of every opportunity. Um, if we did our parts as citizens, because as Ephesians 5.16 tells us, the days are evil. So thank you. <laughs>